Good morning. It's a joy to be back with you here in Santa Clarita. I, uh, I think I was here about six or seven months ago. I always enjoy being here. Um, it seems that I notice something different about your church every time that I'm here. I recently uh, completed reading a book by Ken Follett called The Pillars of the Earth. It's a story of a cathedral being built in 12th century England and paying attention to the various parts of architecture and such. And so this morning, and I'm here looking, I noticed these bracing beams at the front of the church. I may not have noticed that any other way, but um, a lot goes into building a cathedral or a church. And of course, you know, according to the Apostle Peter, we are living stones set up to be the true house of God. So how is your architecture this morning? I hope that you are built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Before I begin my message for today, I always stop to pray. So we just bow your heads with me for a moment. Loving Father in heaven, all that we are is of you. All that we can become is from you. And all the mess that we are in is ours and ours alone. So Lord, we bring you the mess that we have made of our lives. And we say, Daddy, when you help me, will you fix what I have broken? Will you make me whole and restore me to a place at your side now and for eternity. Lord, may it be your word that is heard this morning. Forgive my faltering ability to convey the message you've laid on my heart, but Lord, speak through your words, please. For we ask it in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. I'd like for you to open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 6. Now, I want you to use your sanctified imagination this morning, and I want you to try to picture what Isaiah is describing. Now, he mentions that it's the year that King Isaiah died. That's also Azariah, another name for him. And there are uh, various ways of accounting for time in history before our current method of reckoning years. Um, those of you who are older like I am may remember the year that President Kennedy died. Those of you who are a little bit younger may remember when the Berlin wall fell. Those of you who are younger yet have no doubt your own, your own landmark events that you can point to and say, oh, I remember when that happened. Isaiah was still a very young man. He lived a fairly long life, but he was a fairly young man at this time. And we start in verse 1 of Isaiah 6. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, as Isaiah is seeing this, this is a vision God didn't literally come to Jerusalem, to the temple, and fill 
the whole house. The one whose glory would fill the temple came uh, several hundred years later when Jesus ultimately fulfilled that prophecy. But in vision, Isaiah sees what he has seen before, the temple of the Lord, only this time. He sees in the midst of that temple an exalted throne rising high and seated on the throne is the Lord of hosts. What he sees is really the train or the the flowing parts of his robe. But he is in awe. By the way, you may know that according to the book Great Controversy, at the end of time, when the holy city with Christ and the redeemed come to the earth and the unsaved are resurrected and are surrounding the city, that once again all humanity will see the Lord seated on his throne, high and lifted up. You ought to read sometime that last chapter in the great controversy and imagine what it would be like to you, whether inside the city or hopefully not outside the city, and you see all of the attention of the world directed to one being. God. And the glory is so great, your ability to frame into words fails you. You just can't do it. Isaiah continues trying to tell the story. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. Now, I'm reading from the NIV, and it says seraphs. If you're reading from perhaps the King James or New King James, it may say seraphim, that I am ending makes it plural. It's the equivalent of an S in English. But seraphim, the meaning of that is burning ones because they are reflecting the glory of the one on the throne. They're not shining with their own glory. They're not burning with their own holiness. They are reflecting like mirrors the glory of the Lord. And as they are there with the Lord, they were calling to one another, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Maybe you've wondered, why did they say it three times? Because in Hebrew, that was the superlative. Holy, holier, most holy. So they are saying, there is nothing more holy than the Lord Almighty. God has many, many different names. But Almighty is one of my favorites because I don't want a weakling God. I don't want a God who is like Joe the plumber. I want a God who is not like John down the street. I don't want a God that is as weak and powerless as I am. I want a God who is almighty. I want a God who can take care of business. I want a God who can rescue me. And the angels are saying, this is the God. His name is Yahweh. That's what the Lord means when it's all in capital letters, the divine name of God. It means I am. 
I am eternal and I am self-existent. I am not dependent on anybody for anything. I am that I am. And I am not a weakling. I am the Almighty and these angels that are singing his praises. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Everywhere that you can look where God has not veiled himself for our protection, everywhere God's glory is seen. Isaiah continues in verse 4, At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Just the praise of God was like an earthquake shaking the temple. Not a destructive earthquake, but it as though the inanimate objects were acknowledging this is the Almighty God. And Isaiah says, woe to me. What does woe mean? Sadness, disaster, condemnation. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. His response to seeing the Lord is not, wow, let me grab my phone. Can we get a selfie? That's not what he's thinking. He is thinking, how can I even be alive in the presence of the most holy, eternal, and self-existent Almighty God? I like to think about this scene, but I must confess to you that my ability to envision it in my imagination is terribly flawed. I cannot fully comprehend this. The majesty of the Lord, brighter than the sun, so holy that even sinless beings like the seraphim cannot restrain their voices from praise. That's a holy God. So what is holiness? Well, there really isn't much of a secular definition of holiness. Because to be holy is to be separate from everything that we experience in the regular world. It is to be other entirely other, not like we are. We try to imagine what God is like, but there is no comparison. We can't say God is like this. God has no simile. God is more than anything we have ever seen, ever experienced, ever even contemplated. God is more than that. He is totally and completely separate. And yet, his desire is to be one with us. That's not a contradiction. That's a mystery. How can the greatest other that exists want to be joined with us? What else is is it to be holy? It's to be pure, without any contamination. 
Maybe you've seen advertisements for gold that is supposed to be 99.9% pure. Why don't they say 100%? Because there is no 100% purity, except God. God is not contaminated. God is not an amalgam. God is completely pure, without spot or blemish, morally pure. That means when you're looking at things from a right and wrong perspective, God is not wrong at all, ever. And why is that? Because God's character is the definition of what love is. Love is not a description of God as much as it is a definition. God cannot be unloving because his very essence is love. But along with love, his essence is justice. Now we want fairness. When you were a child and you were playing games, sometimes somebody would do something that kind of cheated in the rules, and you'd say, that's not fair. No one would ever say that about God. God is fair, and he's always fair. He's just. So what do we do with love and justice? How do we bridge these two? Are they not antithetical? Are they not opposites? We think of love as indulgence and justice as severity. It's because God has a way of mingling those two with mercy. God wants justice everywhere. God wants love everywhere. But God knows that in spite of the fact that we were created perfect, we were contaminated shortly after creation. We don't know how long it was. Was it a week? Was it a year? Was it 10 years? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us that. But we were created perfect by a perfect God who can't mess things up. But God gave us the ability to decide for ourselves. It's called free will. What a strange thing for God to do. But remember, the first attribute of God's character is love. And love is not a solitary thing. That's why there cannot be only one being in God. There must be a plurality because love has to be given and love has to be received, and you can't do that in and of itself. <laughs> and God, when he decided he wanted children in his realm, and specifically on this world, God said, I want them to love me. But in order for them to do that, they have to have the power to choose. Because love can't be commanded. Well, yes, you can say, love me. You can say to a child, if you don't love me, I'm going to smack your rear end. I'm going to make it so hot you won't be able to sit down for three weeks. That child may act as though she or he loves you, but will they? Will it not be a cowering fear, a fear of getting the hand of retribution? God had to create us with the ability to choose so that we could choose 
to love him. And with that came the awful risk that we would choose not to love him. And you know far too well that that was the choice that was made on our planet. And every person born on this planet, with the exception of Jesus the Christ, everyone born here has been born separated from God other than perfection. Now the problem is, when you take absolute perfection, like God, and total imperfection, like us, they are not compatible. Because the Bible says in many places that our God is a consuming fire. Fire is the way that God's holiness is expressed most often. Even the seraphim, the burning ones, because they're reflecting the holiness of God. It's why every sacrifice that was made was an offering made by fire unto the Lord. The sacrifice represented the sinner and the fire represented the holiness of the Lord. And when the holiness of the Lord and the sinner came into proximity, which one? Was it the holiness of God or was it the sinfulness of the earth? Sin is consumed in the presence of holiness. It cannot coexist. So God needed to come up with a way. How is it that I can make sinful, contaminated humanity compatible with holy God? God had to pull back to shield himself and his glory and his holiness from us so that his very presence would not consume us. Now, we're not going to go into a long description about how God went about that. You know that story to a great extent. But let's just take for a moment one story about how God was showing His holiness to the Israelites. You know, in the sanctuary, the outer precincts, there was the altar of burnt offerings, representing the cross of Jesus. There was the laver, the washing place, representing baptism. When you went into the holy place, there was the menorah, Jesus, the light of the world. And there was the table of the bread of the presence symbolizing the body of Christ. The altar of incense that pressed up close to the veil that represented intercession between our world and the presence of the Lord. But inside the most holy place... The Ark of the Covenant was the symbol of God's throne. You just didn't walk in there. In fact, if you were a regular priest, as close as you could ever get was the outside of the veil. The high priest alone could go in there because the high priest prefigured Jesus. But in that symbolic sense, the high priest could only go in there one day a year. That's how holy it was. And Jewish tradition says that when the high priest did go in there, there were bells on the bottom of the priest's robe. You know that, right? Jewish tradition said they tied a rope around the ankle. Because if the priest went in there and he had not reckoned himself totally to God, He would die in there, and nobody could go in, so they'd have to pull him out. We have no record of that ever having occurred. But you don't just waltz into the presence of the Lord. Now, if you were to look in 2 Samuel 
chapter 6, you'd find the story where King David is wanting to take the Ark of the Covenant that has come back from the Philistines and it had been stored, it's hard to imagine, but it had been stored in the house of Ohio, not Ohio with an A, Ohio. It had been covered because nobody could look at it, but David wanted to bring it back to Jerusalem. And they had it on a cart that was drawn, drawn by oxen. Well, first of all, they hadn't read the Bible because it was never to be put on a cart. It was to be carried by the priests. So they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. And Uzzah, one of the sons of Ohio, was walking to the side <coughs> of the cart. And the oxen stumbled. And the ark began to lean. And Uzzah thought, oh, I'd better straighten it. I'd better hold it so that it doesn't fall. Because the Ark of the Covenant had been in his father's house for quite some time. He was used to seeing it. It didn't surprise him any more than to see this microphone or this guitar. It was covered, yes, but it had lost, in his estimation, its absolute holiness because it represented the presence and the throne of Almighty God. And so he presumed to just touch it, to keep it from falling. He had good intentions. But he died. David got mad at God. Called the place Perez Uzzah. Breakout against Uzzah. Did God break out? No, God was exactly who God had always been, the most holy, almighty God. Uzzah had thought because he had seen that shrouded shape in his father's house that he could touch it. We can't come into the presence of God on our own without being destroyed. And so, we get a little bit of a glimpse of what holiness is about. Now, I want you to turn to 1 Peter, toward the end of the New Testament, the first chapter of 1 Peter. I chose this from the New Testament even though it's quoting from Leviticus 20. But I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 1, and I want you to look at verse 15. I'll give you just a moment to find it. If you're using the Bible like mine, it would be under the heading, Be Holy, but down a couple of lines, verse 15. Peter says, but just as he who called you is holy. Now, who is it that called us? It's the Christ. Okay, Jesus has called us, and he's holy. So Peter says, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. And we kind of scratch our heads and say, do what? Be holy? How could I possibly be holy? I am no better than Uzzah. Uzzah thought to enter the presence of God, and it destroyed him. And so we come to what was our scripture reading for this morning? We are commanded to be holy. So let's go back to Romans chapter 7. 
And I want you to keep in mind that we are reading the words of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul encountered Jesus on the Damascus Road. His glory was so great that Paul was blinded by it, never fully recovered his eyesight, enough to be functional, but still with enough sight impediment that he was reminded continually of his encounter with Jesus. Paul knows that God is holy. And Paul knows that God wants us to be holy. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, Be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Kind of a paraphrase of the same idea. And so Paul wants to be like Jesus. Do you want to be like Jesus? Have you thought about it seriously? Do you really want to be like Jesus? I hope the answer is an affirmative one. Paul wanted to be like Jesus. And he confesses to us. This is a confession. When I was in college, I had a teacher that said this was Paul talking about his life before his conversion. Baloney. It is not, and I'll show you why it's not. Paul says, starting in verse 15, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. If you're pre-conversion, do you want to do the will of God? No. <laughs> If you wanted to do the will of God, it would be because the Holy Spirit had worked on your heart. <laughs> the fact that Paul says, I have the desire to do what's right, means that he was already converted. He had already given his heart to Jesus. He was many years into his ministry. This is the guy who wrote just about half of the New Testament. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. In other words, I'm condemned by what the law reveals to me. The law is right. I'm a sinner. Apostle of Jesus Christ, evangelist to the Western world, yes, but a sinner, yes. If I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good, as it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Do you have this dichotomy in your mind? Your higher mind says, I want to live with Christ. I want to be perfect. I want to be just like Jesus. And then you have the base mind that says, oh boy, what about me? What about my desires? What about the things that make me feel good? <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 18. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do, I, for what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. I think if we were honest with ourselves, we would have to say this is our experience too. Interestingly, there are some Christians 
who teach what is often referred to as perfectionism, that over time and with great discipline, we can cease to be sinners. No, we can't. No more than a leopard can say, these spots are so last year, I want stripes this season. Any more than a person from Ethiopia can say, you know, those Asian folks have much nicer complexions. Not not that they do. I'm just using the illustration from the Scripture. Every person and every nationality is as beautiful as any other. But I can't say, you know, it's so cold here. Maybe if I could change my complexion, I could be more comfortable. You can't do it. You are what you were born to be. We are born in a world where we are separated from God. That means we're sinners. Every last one of us. And so we're like Paul. You know, I want to do the will of God. I want to be just like Jesus. But I can't. This, of course, comes as a huge surprise to God, right? (laughs) No. You can't surprise God. You'll never find anywhere in Scripture where there's a surprise party for God. He knows what's going on all the time. God knows that we cannot, of ourselves, be perfect. And so, if we were to go to Genesis chapter 15, we find out what God's plan is. Verse 6 of Genesis 15. Abraham believed the Lord, and he, that is the Lord, credited it to him as righteousness. Do you believe that? If you don't, start praying for the Holy Spirit to make it clear to you. The only way that a human being can be perfect or righteous is by God's method. God's method alone brings righteousness, holiness. There is nothing else that works. Absolutely nothing else. And what does God want us to do? Trust Him. Believe Him. God says, I don't want you to die. I want you to be with me forever. I want you in my presence. Why do you think I created the human family in the first place? Because I hate people? I love you. God says, do you believe me when I tell you that I love you? Did I not take the dearest of my own heart and send him to live among you for 30-some years and to suffer and be crucified and die in agony so that you could be reconciled to me? Does that not yet prove to you that I love you? Do you believe that? So if the only way to be made righteous is to believe God when he says, I love you and I want to reconcile you to myself, if that's the only way to be righteous or holy or perfect, then it becomes really important that we believe God. But I have discovered that we humans, I will speak in the first person, that I am very often delusional about my own actions. 
you might find the same is true of you, that you desire to be a good, patient, and loving person, but like Paul, you can't carry it out. And in order to ease the sting of that, we pretend that we are not so bad by comparing ourselves to other people. It doesn't matter which side of this you come down on, there's problems on both sides, whether the police officer who shot the unarmed black man or the black man who shot the police officers were bad people. Some of us have got better restraints on the iniquity of our hearts than others, but we're all in trouble, but we don't always recognize it. So the Apostle Paul, the same Apostle Paul who says, I can't be good even though I really want to be, look what he says in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, and I want to start at verse 17. Paul says, what I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later, later than Abraham believing God and having it credited as righteousness. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God. That covenant was, you believe me, you trust me, I'm calling you and making you righteous in my sight. He says, the law doesn't change that. So why did God give the law? Well, he puts it very clearly and distinctly down in verse 24. I must apologize. The older I get, the smaller the print looks. Verse 24. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. The purpose of the law is so that when you look at it, you say, oh, woe is me, for I am a person of unclean lips, mind, heart, and total being. I am undone. I am a sinner. The law tells us you are going to die when the Lord comes in glory, unless you believe in the promises of Jesus. You see, if we don't get to the point where we recognize our personal sinfulness, our wretched inability to be good, if we don't get to that, we totally miss the glory of grace. If you don't know your personal despicable nature, what joy is there in grace? Oh, good, God forgave me. Now I can go on with my life. I don't have to be any different. If that were the case, Paul would say, you know, I can't be good, but it doesn't matter because Jesus died for me. It's because Jesus died for me that it does matter. How can I be grateful for salvation if I do not realize what a desperate situation I'm in? Now here... There's a call for balance. Because a lot of people think that they know what righteousness is, and so they want to tell everyone, you need to come up here where I am. You need to be what I am. You need to be like me. Let me explain it to you, sinner. No. The Bible says that if the blind lead the blind, what happens? They both fall in the ditch. 
You cannot say, I have figured it out. <clears throat> I have now spiritually arrived, so let me inform you, sister. Let me just tell you, brother, this is what you need to do. No. The law's function is for you. The condemnation that comes to your heart when you compare your life against the sinless character of God as described in those Ten Commandments, if you see your sinfulness in the law, then it has fulfilled its purpose. It's not there for you to beat someone else over the head with it. You can be as hard on yourself as you wish to be, but you need to be loving and merciful to everyone else. Because the Holy Spirit has a perfect record of pointing out to each individual's their need for reformation. Not every person listens to the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit does that job flawlessly. And if you've been listening in your own life, you know what I mean. The Holy Spirit can let you know that a change is needed. And I must be broken by my sense of personal helplessness. I've got to hit rock bottom. I have got to say I tried to do it myself and I failed. And I failed and I failed and I failed. There is a tense in Greek that does not exist in English, and it's what Paul uses there in Romans 7, that the evil that I hate, I continually do. It's, it's a tense that shows ongoing action. We've got to use a different phraseology in order to convey it. If you've ever wondered, why do I keep falling? It's what sinners do. But my desire is to be like Christ. And so the more I recognize my sinful condition, the more I have to cry out to the one who says, if you trust me, I'll make you righteous. How can you celebrate grace if you do not recognize your need of grace? How can you rejoice in the salvation of God if you think, I'm doing okay. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Yeah, you are. So-and-so may be more upfront in sinful actions, but in your soul of souls, you are no, dark, no doubt as dark and lightless as they, because that's what sinners are like. But God says, I don't leave you as a sinner. When you come to Jesus and you say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, you are really saying, I believe. I know that I need your grace. I know that I need your character to cover me. And the thought no sooner is clarified in your mind than God makes it the present reality. Now we said that sinfulness, like the sacrifice, when it comes into holiness, the flame, sin, is consumed. The sacrifice was Christ. Those animal sacrifices only forward, pointed forward to him because God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us that in him, Jesus, we might become the what? Righteousness of God. Now, if God's holiness is fire, 
And God has given you the holiness of Jesus, you're not combustible anymore. You're part of the fire. Because your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's what is so amazing about grace. If you have been struggling with depression and defeatism because you cannot be good enough, then recognize that God made Jesus to be sin for you so that you could have the righteousness of Jesus. His grace is your righteousness. So rejoice, fellow traveler, fellow pilgrim, fellow sinner. There is an answer to the sin problem. We must admit that we are sinners, and then we can rejoice that Christ is our righteousness.